Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 180, VK AMA. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. Now, with Deanna and I just getting back from vacation a few hours ago, we didn't have a lot of time for prep for tonight's show. So we decided to host a live AMA tonight where we'll be answering questions live from the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. After that, we've got a review of Gunky Mono from Renegade Games, and then a week in review with Sean, where Sean's been um Wow, where Sean's been checking out a new virtual tabletop called Master's Toolkit from Ark and Forge. And we've got some very early thoughts on the Ghost Betwixt, as well as some talk about other games we played while Sean was in town. Welcome to the suggestion box. D says my video is moving. Yes, you're bouncing your desk. Oh, am I bouncing? I don't. Okay, hey, the fly is driving me nuts. Oh yeah, I don't know what was making what bounce. <clears throat> All right, here we highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. Up first, we have Wayner three ninety six who commented on our Orleans trade and intrigue review on YouTube to say, "Really good review." Was really debating if I wanted to pull the trigger or not on this one. This video really helped. I think I'm going to give it a try. Thank you. Well, thanks for the comment, Wayner. Uh, I love it when I see comments on some of our older content. It makes me happy to see people are out there discovering our stuff. Well, let's move on to our Arnak review, where we asked, does the Lost Ruins of Arnak live up to the hype? Well, Peter Schott says, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> and Brock Wager we 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 goes into a bit more detail with, I really like your expl explanation that it's an engine builder that uses worker placement and deck building as the components of the engine. Now, Reverend Fox doesn't have anything to say about the game, but commented that the auto-generated subtitles on our feeds are hilarious. And finally, Jay Barons with the obligatory, the expansion is a must-have. Well, thanks everyone for the comments. Um, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to actually care about this review since the hype seems to have pretty much died down on our act and everyone's already made their decision. Uh, so I'm glad people actually did take the time to find out what we thought. Let's finish off with a couple of comments on our topic of video game elements. We would love to see more on the tabletop. Now, Keith J. Davies writes, regarding save points in games, I believe Seventh Continent has a mechanic for that. It was a selling point in the Kickstarter, as I recall. I didn't have the money at the time to buy in the way I wanted, and it's only gotten bigger since then. And Donna, who actually inspired the topic, wrote to say, Just caught up with the episode answering my question about video game experiences brought to the tabletop. What a great discussion. Thank you for the really thoughtful responses. As soon as you started talking about onboarding, learning the game by playing the game, I knew I was in for an enlightening segment. Nice. Wingspan, yeah, I know, has a terrific onboarding where you select specific marked cards from the deck and follow a scripted first round. You can then play out the rest of the game. And in terms of the idea of achievements, I love the observation that they can alert you to things that are, that are possible in the game mm -hmm. that might prompt you to play differently. Super Skill Pinball has achievements, and I think they're really fun. You know, one of these days we are going to have to track down a copy of Wingspan, but it'll have to be one weekend when you're in town, Sean, so you can play it too. So thank you for the comments, Keith and Donna, and I'm glad you appreciated our handling of that topic. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Now, did you realize we've been doing this for almost four years? Seriously, four. Like, it does not feel like it's been nearly that long. Like, like I, I don't know if that's normal, just like, oh, we've been doing this way longer than it feels like. But most of the time we've been live, not all of it. We've been in quarantine. 
And honestly, up until today, actually, like working on the show notes today, I was thinking it was our three year anniversary. And it was someone in our Discord channel who pointed out they thought it was four years. So actually, it's four years. Like, seriously, how, how are we at four years already? Yeah, well, regardless, it's time to celebrate. Very true. In celebration of our four year anniversary, we're going to host a special ep uh, episode of our live show next week. Uh, no review. Uh, maybe some talk about what we've been playing, depending on what we play in the next couple of weeks, and hopefully some feedback from fans. And what I'm looking for is some of their best bellhop moments of the last year. If you've got a bellhop moment you want to share, send it to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or stop by our Discord and drop it in there. That'll work too. I would love to share your favorite episodes. Talk about a game you bought because of one of our reviews, your favorite mess up that we've had, or your favorite editing moment, me smashing my hand off this damn bar multiple times in a row, uh, your favorite sausage making moment, etc. Along with that, we'll be talking about a few of our favorite moments, our best new to us games discovered in the last year, and the usual kind of stuff you expect from a podcast anniversary episode. And knowing Deanna, there's a really good chance we may have a cool few promos or other tchotchkes to give away during the show. We'll also be looking to do a live web meeting for the after show so that you, our fans, can interact with us and each other real time. So hope to see you here live, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop Wednesday, July the 27th, 9 p.m. Eastern for the Tabletop Bellhop for your anniversary episode. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. So due to the fact that Anna and I just got home from vacation um, not too long ago, and we really didn't want to have to cancel the show two weeks in a row, we decided what we would do tonight is host an AMA and ask us anything. That's right. Tonight, we're going to be answering questions from the Lobby Art chat room here, live on Twitch. So start getting those questions in, lobbyists. So to get things started and give people time to get their questions in, I've got something fun we can do uh, here where everyone watching and listening can technically play along at home. Uh, you're going to go over to a new window, don't close us, and open up Board Game Geek, and you're going to sort the list by rank and find the games ranked 1,000 or higher, which I am going to also do over in another window over here. So this question comes from Cardboard Conjecture, host of the What You've Been Playing Wednesday podcast that Mo takes part in most weeks. They ask, what are your five top picks of games below 1,000 overall or even below 2,000 overall on BGG? And I think technically they mean above, uh, but, you know, below, yeah, they, lower in the below, ranks, lower above in the then. number. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. But worse than 1,000. Yeah, worse than 1,000 or even worse than 2,000 overall on Board Game Geek. Now, I don't, I, 2,000 might be a bit much, so we're going to start with the 1,000. And again, here's your chance, chat room. If you've got any questions for us, get them in now. Uh, we do have a couple we copied over for your Discord, so you don't have to repeat those if you did ask them earlier. Now, in the meantime, what we're going to do is I haven't really prepped for this much. I did give it a cursory look earlier. I'm going to scroll through the list, and what I'll do is I'll mention the first five I find. So that'd be like the highest rank five games. But then I want to keep going and go through the full list and see pick like my five favorite out of all of them. And what I think I'll do is call out some other notables, just like, oh, that was a really good game. And oh, that one was neat. And I can't believe that's ranked so low. Yeah. Now, while Mo's getting started, I did a little early work to give him a little extra time to search. So I'm going to go through some, uh, some I found in some of those higher numbers. And right off the bat, I was shocked. Rallyman GT is at 1002, and I'm sorry, yeah. but that game deserves to be in the top thousand. Rallyman GT is just a really fun, accessible racing game. Yeah, I, I can't deny that one. I, I didn't put it on my list because I knew it was on yours. Rallyman GT is a solid game. I still haven't played a physical copy. I really want to try a physical copy of that. I think there's going to be like it's already good playing digital, but yeah. like being able to hold the dice and stuff, I think is going to be awesome. Uh, so next up is one both of us are going to share. And again, this is just just edging over that 1000 number at 1004. Our show favorite. There aren't too mm -hmm. many times we don't, you know, we, it's usually about every six to ten episodes that we'll mention this game. Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Yeah, fantastic game for the whole family. Kids game that even adults will enjoy. Uh, now, I think uh, I think there's one you'll probably like in here before my next one. 
Do you want me to start going? Okay. So, so start at the top of the list. Some I've noticed Courier's stuck out to me right away. It's not a top five for me, but it's the first game on this list. I would have no problem playing. I wouldn't turn down a game. Courier's a fantastic dice drafting, bag building, weird fantasy game that was fantastic when it came out, but then got overshadowed by Dice Masters. And I still say Dice Masters is the better version of Courier's, but I would still not turn down a game of Courier's. Oh, fair enough. And then the next one I have, of course, is Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Again, I didn't put it in the top five because I knew you'd put it in the top five. <laughs> uh, and then... So Quarriers was at 1,003, Ghost Fight and Treasure 1,004. And I next dropped down to Diamonds at 1012. Again, I just want to call this out because it's a trick-taking game that I love because it's heart spades, clubs are all different games. Everyone knows, well, this is someone finally made Diamonds, and it's one of the few trick-taking games that plays six players. I wouldn't call this a top five, but Diamonds is a solid game at 10-12. Right. So uh, my next one sneaks in, and this is one that we've talked about another version of, but uh, that's Ticket to Ride London, the short, brief, uh, sort of tiny map version of Ticket to Ride that's just enough Ticket to Ride that I don't get sick of it and hate it. Yep. And that's totally at uh, 1,015. All right, my next one that stuck out at 1027, Merlin. This may have been a top five for me, but it's not because I don't own it. I only got to play this game at Origins um, with the, not the designer there, but like the, the, the publisher there kind of coaching us on how to play it. This is a Rondell based Stefan Feld game set in the Arthurian period. It seemed fantastic. It's been on my wish list for a long time. That was at 1027. All right. I got to figure out when you're jumping back in and then I can uh, yeah, keep, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right. <laughs> this is what happens on AMAs where we're like <laughs> just scrolling through. Uh, next, I have Chimera Station. I want to call out because the other day we were talking about board game elements or video game elements we would like in board games. And at 1031, Chimera Station is a game where you it's a worker placement game where you can improve your worker. And I'll admit, it's not my favorite game. It's not fantastic, but I love that concept. And it was doing something new. It's not always you get a board game where it's doing something completely new. Absolutely. Uh, next one, you know what? I could I could have put this next one on here, and I didn't. I don't know. I, you know, and I, I, I skipped right past this one that you got grabbed on here, and this is one of your top five, I think. Yeah, and that would be Galaxy Trucker. Um, yeah, any edition, the new edition, the old edition. Um, this one's got to be a top five. I'm mean, I mean, you know what I'll do is I'll go through the whole list and then I'll, I'll do my top fives after I'll call out which ones are my top. Uh, so galaxy trucker is fantastic game, real time, build spaceships, go on a run, watch your spaceship get destroyed and hopefully make it to the end with at least some of a ship still together. Okay. Now, next one is one I pulled off of my list from board game arena and that's haggis at uh, 1050. It is just a, f whoa, what the heck? What? I just, uh, that's not good. I have no idea what's happening. Uh, they are going to, they're going to shut down on my meeting, our meeting. What? Uh, apparently two, two person meetings no longer have unlimited time. Okay. Right in the middle of a podcast episode. Remaining meeting time. Zoom no longer allows unlimited two person meetings. Apparently. So what do we end it and restart it? And then, then we got to find some alternative for next week. Uh, well, I mean, I, I well, yeah, I guess. Like we could jump to Jitsi, but that's not going to work for. Well, it's uh, nothing set up for Jitsi. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, then this is going to be all right. Well, we got nine minutes. Um, we had nine minutes. All right. Let's, let's see if we can at least get through this question in nine minutes. Uh, I'll go a little quicker. Next one that caught my eye was whistle stop a train game that's not a train game that's about route building kind of has a zero element to it but it's a more of a heavy euro i do really like whistle stop next is primordial soup sean we need to put this on the list for you to play this yeah, is a, i know we've a, talked about this a number of times poop game and i never think to put it on the damn list this is a game where you play a, a microbe and you go around and you eat the poop of other microbes which causes you to poop so they can eat more and then you evolve your microbe to become multi-celled organisms or get jaws or tentacles or flagellum and you're trying to make your species survive in the primordial soup this is a fantastic game next i have fleet i gotta call this game out fleet is so good even Sean played Fleet yep. years ago. I'll admit we haven't played it in a long time, which is which is just 
new hotness. We're too busy playing the the old new hotness around here. But the fleet fleet is still one of the best card games out there, using the power grid auction mechanic and uh, engine building. Fleet fantastic fishing game. Next, I've got the game. I, the game is way too good. Like it's it's cooperative. Try to play cards in order from one to a hundred or a hundred to one. I have no idea why it's that dang good, but the game. And I'll admit, you got to play it a couple times. Like when I first saw this and tried it, I was like, yeah. But until you sit down and play the game, you're like, oh wow, this actually has a lot more depth in it. Right. And Sean learned the game not this time he was down, but the last time he was down, and I think you agree. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, follow up the board game. This isn't going to be a top five, but man, it again does some really cool stuff. It actually makes you feel like you're playing the fallout game, but then totally flounders in other ways, like random items being found and random combat and runaway leader problems. So close to a fantastic game. With the expansion, this might have been higher. I haven't tried it. Fair. Yep. No, that's fair. Next is one I think Deanna would have on our list. That's Hacienda. Hacienda is is a hidden gem. It is it, there's a new edition that just actually recently came out. It looks very uh, brighter, but seems seems to be the same gameplay. Uh, it's it's a Euro game. You're you're placing tiles and animals and trying to collect route connect routes. Uh, huge hit, Hacienda. One that might have been higher on my list if I played it more sentient. We played this with Tori and Cat and really liked it, but so far I played the game twice. Really interesting dice drafting game. Yeah. Two games I thought would be way higher is Starship Catan and Starfarers of Catan. Two yeah. great versions of Catan that no one talks about. And I'll admit, Starship Catan, I think, has just dropped this low because it's been out of print so long that no modern gamers played it. Right. Like anyone new to the hobby has never even seen this game. So it just it's, it's just going to slowly drop as it doesn't get new ratings. Right. Fantastic two player only version of Catan and Starfarers with the awesome ships with the beads in the bottom that you turn upside down and the random encounters you have in space while still rolling dice and collecting resources and building up your engine. Love both of those. Uh, Walking in Burano, the city the city building game where you're, you're building the city of Burano with cards and you get points for like having the most cats which is just such a neat theme in a game. Yep. And like you can have Santa Claus come visit at you because your your buildings have the most chimneys. Right. Uh, one of the lowest ranked ones I can't even believe is even on here is Middle Earth the Wizards. This is my all-time favorite collectible card game. We still have decks of the Wizards sometime. I don't think, Sean, I don't think you were around when we were playing that one. I no. almost want to break out a couple starters because I actually still have starters of that where it'd be like, just play starter versus starter. I, that's the game that destroyed magic for me. Once I got into Middle Earth, I pretty much stopped playing magic. Right. Uh, CV, the game about building your resume, which is just fun if you play with role players because you end up telling a story. It's like, oh, look, I started off as this and I got an internship at my dad's company, which let me tour the world. Meanwhile, someone else like, well, yeah, I had to sell my childhood bike to be able to get some other thing. Fair. Yep. Uh, Kingdoms, abstract strategy game from Rainer Nitzia that was redone as Beowulf, the movie, the board game, which is actually a better version of Kingdoms. But both are ranked terrible because no one knows these games. So, OK, we're good. Uh, I was trying to rush. Now I don't have to rush as much, nope. but really, I don't know. Android, we've talked about that before. The the ridiculous over the top um, trying to do way too much Blade Runner, Philip K. Dick board game set in the android universe that again i i almost wish i hadn't sold my copy just to show it off to people but it was like six hours of not always fun yeah no absolutely. <laughs> but it showed so much prom promise it dragged. yep <laughs> next up uh, on your list i think on uh, on your list yeah, i know go ahead is uh the climbers and I, absolutely this one this one i cannot believe this one is almost at 1500 it is such a fun game uh, I think one of the things that probably knocks it down is that it's not a dexterity game, yes. but it requires dexterity. Or people think it's a dexterity game. Possibly. Like like when you look at that box, you're just like, oh, it's another hamster roll or stacking game. Right. And that's not at all what it is. But it does require dexterity to play. Yes, Playing it drunk is, is really amusing. Yep. Our next classic games workshop, when they finally decided you could play Warhammer Fantasy without needing a thousand point army, Mordheim. Uh, you can see my copy just under my shoulder there. My copy of Mordheim still back there. It is one of two Games Workshop games I have a fully painted army for. So that game doesn't need a full army, but I actually <laughs> have a fully painted units and uh, some even customized after playing a couple battles with uh, Deanna's cousin. 
Uh, Sanctum, we just played that last time Sean was down. That is the Diablo board game. I am really surprised it's that low. Oh, we stopped. I sorry, I stopped saying the numbers. Fifteen fifty one. Yeah, you know what? I mean, Sanctum. That's a this prod that doesn't really surprise. It doesn't me. feel like a. It's it feels like a top five hundred to me. I, I just mean, the feel, CGE, the designers. The the game is. I mean, pro, uh, production wise, yes, but I think the game really kind of bothers people because of the solitaire nature of it. Yeah, uh, it's, a lot it of people is multiplayer don't like, solitaire. A lot of people don't like that solitaire aspect. If you're going to be fighting things, you want either fight together or fight against each other, but not yeah. alongside not each other. Not doing your own thing. <laughs> yeah, the, the, like even the hate drafting in that, it's like, ooh, you grabbed the red one instead of me. Yeah, right? exactly. Like you don't even know what the items are. See, the biggest one I found with that, where you didn't bother you when you played it, was I hate the transition from one style of play to the boss fight, which plays completely different. I, I, think I, I feel like I'm playing two different games. At it it would have bothered me more if I hadn't been well aware it was coming. Yeah, that's true. So uh, next, one of the most unique games in my entire collection is La Boca at 1595. We need to play this again, but we need a group like it's 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 like you need six or eight people to be able to play this game. It's a two player dexterity building game where you're each trying to build part of a pattern, but you can only see half of it. So I see one half, you see another half, and it's like, no, no, I, I can see a red, so move it so you can see a red. And there's a timer, and it's like one of those, you know, you're rushing, you get that adrenaline, you get done, you know? And I remember playing this and someone finishing in like a six second round after other people's had like a two minute round and like high fives happening and everything. Next, a massive 4X game. This is another one Sean should probably try at some point. Exodus Proxima Centauri. The thing Exodus did that no other 4X game had done at the time was diminishing resources. So you would get to a planet and it would have ore and you would put a D6 on it. And every time you mine the ore, it would go down. Five, four, three, two, one. Other than that, it's another Twilight Imperium. Pick your role, explore, fight each other, build ships, upgrade your ships. But the neat thing was that diminishing resources was just something I'd never seen before. I'm going to slip in here and add one that you missed yep. in your in your numbered here. Oh, probably. You I'm scrolling battle through. Sheep. No, battle battleship. <laughs> battleship is a neat game. I, I admit, if I was doing kids games, battleship's fair. Battleship's one of those games you're like, wow, this is way better than it has any well, right. That, to yeah, be. and that's the thing. I mean, it's not a great game, but it's just way better than it has any right to be. <laughs> yep. No, I mean, exactly. Which probably means that uh, you know at 1600 or so, it's or 1640 or something like that. It's 1621 it's probably about the right number for it <laughs> yeah I, that's higher than i would have guessed actually I, i'm surprised enough people have tried battleship to get it there right uh next warhammer disc wars this was warhammer without having to buy miniatures done in very unique way now i know it was based on an existing disc wars game so it wasn't unique but literally your armies were discs and to move you flip them and like to charge, you would flip three times. And if you landed on another disc, you won. And it had the best, um, you know, like multiple people get in a fight rule because you literally had a stack of discs and you just did them in stack order. Like this guy fought the guy under him and this guy fought the guy under him. And then eventually they battled the guy in the bottom. And, and and it had all the, you know, the armies, the dwarves, the Skaven, the Empire, the orcs and goblins and unique units and everything was asymmetric. That was a hidden gem. And unfortunately, it was the casualty of Games Workshop pulling their license from Fantasy Flight, or else it probably would still be going strong. Right. Uh, next one. This, this is probably the best game in the list, in my opinion. Going up to 2000 is Hamster Roll, my absolute favorite dexterity game. I can never say enough good things about Hamster Roll. If you're going to buy one dexterity game, that's the one to buy. Yep. No, I can't can't disagree at all. I I you, I don't love all of the dexterity games you do, but Hamster Roll is one I have never complained when I see that one broken out. Yeah, great game. Uh, next, Quest of Valeria. This was Lords of Waterdeep, but done as a card game, and it's really good. It's got the whole thing where you have a hidden lord, you're trying to do things, you're building buildings, playing cards out, but it plays like half the time of Lords of Waterdeep. Of all the Valeria small games, not the big box roll for resource games, it's my favorite. Now, going back to classic Games Workshop again, 1858 ranked Dungeon Quest. This was like the third hobby board game I ever bought. I bought Talisman, and then I bought Warlock of Firetop Mountain, then I bought Dungeon Quest because it had a little talisman on the side, and it said, from the makers of Talisman. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculously random. It's not fair. Um, the player powers are completely out of whack. The whole point is go in and randomly draw dungeon tiles, trying to get to the center of the dungeon, grab some loot and get out. 
What I can't believe is no one compares Clank to this, and they should, because it's the exact same thing, except Clank it makes it fair and it's a better game. <laughs> but I just, I have a soft spot for Dungeon Quest because I played a lot of that. I had every expansion. I even bought the miniatures, which I painted with paint markers because I didn't even know what Games Workshop paints were at the time. Dungeon Quest is just, it, it'll always be a favorite. It's not up here with the Games Workshop stuff because it's not a miniature game. It's downstairs with my board games. And every now and then we break it out. And I got to admit, I usually have more fun than that with than I do with Talisman when I break out my old copy. So a couple uh, you jumped past here. Um, Lignum, have you guys not? Uh, are you, no, I haven't no? played it yet. You, so you haven't played it yet. I thought you, got, I thought you did get a play in. Uh, nope. And then uh, one that, I, that gets passed by a lot, and I've only played it digitally, on uh, when we were testing all the different digital board games around, and that's Keltus. Yeah, um, that one which looks is just a fun little a fun little game that we all played on. I forget which of the one of the board game ones. I think we had to play it to, to, mm -hmm. to get past a certain thing, and that was just a fun little uh, fun little game. All right, last one. This would be probably in Deanna's top five of the top top bot. I don't know what do you call <laughs> bottom thousand out of the bottom thousand. Sync tear. I, to me, this is the ultimate next step game to Ticket to Ride. You're collecting resources and delivering them based on random good value set at the beginning of the game. I, you're moving your little cart around. This is just a fantastic game no one's heard of. Uh, a great game from Rio Grande Games and super hidden gem. Right. Now, what I want to know, I want to know this from Sean first, and then I'll do my own. Start at the bottom. Start at 1999 and go up. What's the first game you're like, sure, I'd sit down and play that. No problem. Uh, I've, there's actually two on that last page, but the first one I get to is Scrabble in 1992. There you go. I mean, I just, you know, I mean, yeah. D might actually agree with me on that one too. You know, I'm surprised Scrabble is that far down. I mean, I guess it's just, yeah, it's that's too probably classic hate and votes. It, yeah, it's too, too classic and hate voting and, and all I, that stuff. All right. For me, it would be Mage War Academy. Mage War was someone trying to make Magic the Gathering more realistic. So in that version, you make your deck, but you have access to your entire deck, the entire game, and you literally put it in physical spell books, which was just cool. You literally flip through your own spell book. When you summon a monster, it actually goes on the board as a miniature. When you put enhancements on or sorry, standees, but whatever, you literally moved around the board and battled your creatures. And like I said, it was someone trying to game up, like make Magic the Gathering more realistic. And I'll admit it was too much. Like it, it was a lifestyle game. It was too hard to do. I had no clue how to build my decks. Anytime I played anyone who knew what they were doing, they just absolutely destroyed me. But the entire concept of it, I thought was really good. And Mage War Academy is actually a dumbed down version of Mage War, where you have smaller decks and a smaller board. And I would totally sit down and play that with someone who knew how to play and could teach me instead of me having to learn it. And I would totally be like, just hand me a deck. I don't want to do the deck building. I don't want to figure everything. Just give me a deck, give me a miniature and let's go. Fair. And if, if you want to say, you know, I, I think it's arguable that Scrabble sort of is, is horribly misplaced and mm. shouldn't be there. Uh, if I were to jump up to the next one at 1974, uh, DC Comics deck building game Forever Evil oh, is up there, go. which I admit is not the best of them, but it yeah. is still a pretty solid expansion. It's no it's no Teen Titans, but uh, it's still worth <laughs> owning. All right. We got a ton of feedback from the chat, which was awesome. I'm glad we did this, actually, yeah. because we got people playing along here. Uh, first one, Math Guy Dave noticed Warhammer Quest. I never played Warhammer Quest. I played Hero Quest. I played Advanced Hero Quest, but I skipped over Warhammer Quest. And just above Conan on my pile of shame for people who know the Conan story is Warhammer Quest, the Silver Tower, which I bought. I brought home and was like, yes, new Warhammer Quest. And I opened it and I saw miniatures I had to assemble on sprues. I put the lid back on the box and I put it on the pile of shame to get to later. That was, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe longer <laughs> at this point. I don't know if I'm ever going to play it. Um, looking at it, it's got some really cool Slanesh miniatures. I don't know. So yeah, Warhammer Quest. Next up from Math Guy Dave, we've got Battletech. Yeah, the Battletech. There were a few different Battletech things in there. I thought about it. I like Battletech, uh, but it's mostly nostalgia. We got Magic Labyrinth, a classic. We recommend that one a lot. That yep. is the game that has magical walls you can't see. And it does neat things with magnets to work, but you literally move your playing piece and like, boom, oh, it hit a wall that you physically couldn't see. Uh, there, next... we were talking about games with immersion. Going yeah. back to the video games, yep. games that make you feel like you're in the game. Magic Labyrinth wins for that. Yeah, especially because you feel the wall like like there is there is physical resistance for the non-existent yeah. wall when you do that. Absolutely. Uh, next up, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. 
I've not gotten to try that one. I, I I think everyone knows my feelings on the betrayal games. And based on everyone I've talked to, Baldur's Gate is better, but does not fix the issues I've had. Right. Uh, and then he's got Kodama at 1330. Solid one. Yep. I, that's just not one I called out, but I own it. I like it. It's it's neat. Um, people don't love it, though. Like, like I have a Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, is a big fan of it. I'm a big fan of it, but that's about it for the local group. Like other people will agree to play, but Deanna's always like, yeah, let's play something else. Fair. Uh, we had uh, packs coming in. I had only ever played the Clever Cubed, but uh, thinks they like all the Clever games, which are coming in at 1026, I guess. Those are not ones I know. Mm. Uh, and she's pointing out that uh, 1,000 to 1,100 is Bellhop Bait. Yes, yeah, there are yeah. a lot of there games are. in there that... Uh... Like, I only I only called out a few. <laughs> like, Sean's just like, do the first five that show up. And I'm like, well, by 1031, I've already got five. Oh, well, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, I had all my... I had five Oh, by I didn't like get my top five. Sorry, I didn't get my top five. So let's back up a bit. My top five out of those are not the first five. Um, I got ha- Hamster Roll, Middle Earth, The Wizards, the, the game. I like the game, the game. God damn it. See, bad spot for this. Primordial Soup. And Galaxy Trucker. Those are my five. Yeah. Uh, so we got uh, a couple of comments about our Zoom issues. Land versus Sea is at 21. Yeah, I didn't get down to the yeah, 20s. We haven't gotten up there yet. Uh, Machi Poro at 1091. But I know you're not a, a huge fan of Machi no, Poro. No, I, I did not. Especially the base game. Like just Machi Poro. Now, the, the, the new one that you just tried, uh, Cities and... Uh, Cities and Lights, which was a Cities Target exclusive that it combined two of the first expansions. It combined the Bright Lights, Big City, and the Harbor expansion with the base game. That was fine. I, I wouldn't put it it's on a top down, list. It's further down this list because I, I ran into it Surprising. later. Surprising. And you know what it is? Everyone loved Machi Koro at first, and then everyone decided it was broken. Right. So I think a lot of people didn't go in and edit their votes. Uh, fair. So Pax is pointing out they love Blueprints at 1095. I've heard good things about that game. Not one I've played. Uh, Starfarers is great. The wonderful new edition. So Math Guy Dave called out Pathfinder card game at 2268. There's actually a, the Skulls and Shackles is actually in this thousand list. I looked at. Now, personally, I didn't play those old ones. I played the core set. If the core set was in here, I'd definitely say. My guess is the newest core set is higher. Right. Uh, New New York 1901 from PAX at uh, 1129. Yeah, that's a solid gateway game. (laughs) That's that's another, that's on my, we need to give it one more shot and either get rid of it because it's it's lighter, it's a gateway game, or keep it and play it more often right uh and then um david dave is pointing out that aventuria is at 2572 see that deserves to be higher but no one can get no the dang can, game no still it. yeah still it's, it's been what two years uh um, and unfortunately my contact at pegasus feel is no longer with pegasus feel so i don't even know what's going on and Dee's pointing out that uh, she avoided playing the climbers because she thought yeah. it was a next game exactly like you look at that box and you're like, oh, it's a stacking game. I don't like stacking games, or I do like stacking games. Uh, there's Pax's beloved Super Skill Pinball 4K <laughs> at twelve twenty two. Uh, Los, still have to try it. Las Vegas Royale at fourteen hundred. Jamie loves that game. So one of the local gamers is a huge fan of that game, and I, I thought it was okay. I I did not love it. Uh, we got Indigo at fourteen thirty nine. Ooh, I missed that. That that's one I scroll past. Indigo is good, Soro. It, it's the only okay so Soro plays up to eight there's the bonus Soro has but for a path game where all you're trying to do is build the path indigo is way better i love indigo indigo is up there because you don't own a spot for one and you're trying to get gems to come out but every time you give a gem to someone they get points and you could get points so you got to be really careful where they go out instead of just like i you're not it's not i want everything to come to me if that if that's all it was it wouldn't work it's i need some to go here and it's okay if they go here it's really good if they go here but it's not great at all if they come over here and you're all playing on the same field right. that, that almost should be on the sean playlist just because it's no nah, i just want to play indigo again that's all <laughs> that is it's been a while uh and then uh six nimit at uh, 1589 all-time fave card game lots of people love those nimit games i admit i've never tried any of them we and should I know give they're it a like try the standard. On, uh, on BGA. Yeah, yeah, just to see if it's a we if, know it's if on we can there, figure it out. But uh and then Dave was saying that the core set was 2268, but he's not sure which edition of the core set that was for Pathfinder. Let's see when I uh, what did I close it? I had it open and then uh browse board games. Let me look. Uh, let's see the 2020 no 2019 core set is 
Yeah, 2268. Yeah, 2268. So it was the Skull and Shackles base set is 1090. So there is definitely one in there. Yeah, in she games. I, I agree that Tabanutsu, the Incan Empire, does look good. That's number 2000. So that's that's a stop at the first game you're willing to play uh, way of, yes. of playing this. Sorry, uh... yes. Which I think that's cool. I like, go backwards and like, what's the first game <laughs> I'll play? At some point, I don't, I don't know how to get to the end of the BGG list. And it doesn't work because there's so many games that are ranked NA. Yeah, it, that it, aren't it, ranked. at a certain point, I think it was around 3000. The list it just kind of falls, falls apart. apart. Yeah, um, you can't you can't just go to the back and go. Uh, yeah, go it forward. looks like people do not like the new edition of the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Core set. I didn't play the old, so I don't know. I just I, I liked it. We got overshadowed by Aventuria. Yeah, Aventuria did a similar thing, but better, in my opinion. All right, so there you have our top five of the games ranked 1,000 to 2,000. We've already spent enough time on this. I don't think we'll do the 2,000 today. Maybe something to do for another AMA. Fair enough. All right, let's go on to a question from Math Guy Dave. I don't know if you want to read this out. Sure, oh, so, there's this too. I didn't yeah, even yeah. see so this Pax, one. Pax actually asked us live in the channel. Let's go to that first. Yeah, I missed it. Let's so do Pax, the live question. <laughs> Pax asked in, uh, in the chat room, I just kickstarted Dead Ball 2nd Edition and got the drive through RPG to start reading through. I don't know how long it's been since you addressed this, but what are some sports-themed games, sports-themed games that you think are great? Oh, that's a full topic. <laughs> we should do that. No, like that's, that's something very <laughs> SEO-friendly. We got to go. do best sports games at some point. So well, I'll do a short answer here. I'll just top of my head. No research, nothing being done whatsoever. Um, I got to start with the classic games workshop, Blood Bowl, which is not a football game. It's actually a rugby game, but don't tell fans that. Because <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, there were there was a completely different rule set that they yes. offered to turn it into football. And but they it were terrible. It was, yeah, it was horrible. Uh, they, they were not did not like those rules. So for with me, the kickoffs I, and the downs. For me, I mean, Blood Bowl, absolutely. Although I'd rather play that digitally these days. Uh, for me, I think, uh, coming back to the list, we just did rally man yep. GT. I, it's, yeah. you know, if, uh, as long as you as consider racing sports, I'm, uh, I'm mm -hmm. there for, uh, for that. And to go with that, uh, formula D is a, a fantastic, uh, the best part about formula D is you can play 10 players and then you can play it as heavy as you want. You can basically play the family friendly version where you're just rolling dice or you can get really into it and do like qualifying races and have to worry about your tires and your your engines and upgrading your vehicles and different driver skills. I love the fact the game has that breadth. Um, next one that came to mind for me, I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's it's baseball highlights, but I can't remember what year. 28, 2045. Baseball highlights 2045. Um, I thought another one that should be on the list for Sean, just because he likes deck building. <laughs> this is a deck building game where you start with your set deck. So it's, it's your team. And then you play through a game against another player. And then you get, you know, money and everything. And you can upgrade your team by getting new players, which then become new cards in your deck to play the next game. And you can, the best part of course, is playing through a, a season. Um, though like a normal game is a season. I think it's like four games, but like you can also do like a world series and then you can also play multiple players and stuff like that. This game is a fantastic deck builder and happens to be about baseball. Like it's really well done. The theme though turns people off. I can't find people to play this. Like I, when Big J lived in Windsor, he loved it. And me and him played a bunch of times and my copy probably hasn't been played since. Right. Uh, I mean, pitch car is obviously going to be on the list for you. I'm gonna, yeah, though that one's really pushing the sports. <laughs> I, I, I'm going. I'm going by uh, BGG definitions right here. They definitely. Oh, they see, I'm not, I'm not doing research. I'm just going off the top of my BGG head. BGG calls to look it up. a sports game. So, uh, uh, Downforce. Uh, have you? Have we recommended no. that one? No. I haven't played Downforce. I've heard really good things. It's a, it's restoration games. It's a remake of a classic game. Right. But I have not played. That's another racing one. Um, I would say Blood Bowl Team Manager. Uh, again, you're going you're going to um, deck building instead. Actually, team manager and baseball highlights are surprisingly similar now that I think of the two <laughs> next to each other. Because, uh, again, you're starting with your basic team and then you're getting star players and skills and whatever refs and all the other stuff and adding to it. So it wasn't the hit I thought it'd be with Sean, but um, <laughs> that is definitely a sports game. Uh, does Camel Up count as a game? Uh... It's a race. I don't know if you count that as a sport. 
Um, there is the the baseball highlights. There's now a football highlights, but I haven't tried that. Yeah, D- um, Dave's there is wrestling not games, a good. Call that a sport. There is not a good hockey game that I know of. Being Canadian, I figure we should mention that. Hmm. I've no. There is an NHL deck builder, but it doesn't rate very well. Uh, yeah, there are a number of fan, different wrestling so. games. So, so oh, the really good one is the WWE Superstar Showdown. Yeah, that is actually fantastic, but only comes with six players that I know nothing about. <laughs> Um, we played that. It's 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 like a miniature skirmish game where you can like throw people out of the ropes and you can pin people outside and there's a rock, paper, scissors aspect to it and program movement. So yeah, WWE Superstar Showdown. Uh Renye Nitsuya's Decathlon. <laughs> you too can play Decathlon with dice. There you go. Uh it's it's basically the box. Oh, actually yeah, the eight bit box yes, has track and field. Track and field, basically. I can't remember what it was actually called. Coliseum or something like that. That was really good, actually, because every game was played different. A lot of it was just um, like bluffing games where you're like you put your dial to one thing. He puts it to something else and then reveal. And uh, a lot of it was and it was uh, resource management. It was how many points do you spend to win this event? Because if you spend all your points now, you're not going to be able to win the later events. And it was surprisingly good. Like we played that with 10 people, I think it was, or eight, whatever the max was. And it was we had a good time. We did that at easy mode. Uh, interestingly, the number one rated sports game on Board Game Geek is Flamme Rouge, yeah, which is the uh, bike racing game running yep. the uh, the Tour de Force. Yep, uh, that one's supposed to be good. I, I have not played Flamme Rouge. It is one. It has won a lot. Of, yep. <laughs> it won or nominated for a lot of awards. See, uh, oh, uh, the NASCAR one, Thunder Out, Al- Thunder Alley, Thunder Ro- it's, Thunder Road, isn't it? it? No, Thunder Road's no, the, the yes, post-apocalyptic thing. Uh, I think it's called Thunder Alley. Again, I'm off the top of my head. So that's true. Math Guy Dave should totally check out Flam Rouge. Uh, uh, what is it called? Thunder Alley, yes. Thunder Alley, yeah. Thunder Alley is really good, actually. Um, I already had Blood Bowl. There's, like, games about, like skiing there's husky oh, yeah. racing games well that we we actually did like three or four different husky racing games yeah, on, on for, uh, kickstarter the one that one week yeah, the one yeah. sunday but like before that there were already some yeah um the, the, what's the there's a football one that's supposed to be really good but i'm drawing a blank on what it's called uh, blitz blitz ball something blitz uh, ball, no blitz ball was was a uh, another gw one no that's that's the uh, the easy blood bowl uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. There's one that was named after a video game. Oh, Techno Bowl. Techno Bowl. Yes, that's it. Techno Bowl. I haven't there, played it, it, but Techno a lot of tech- people like. There's two different ones: the video game, one's the board game. There's Techno and Tech Bowl, and I'm not sure which one. I uh, think it's the No. Tech yes, no it's Techno Bowl. Techno. Yeah, I get them confused, but that's supposed to be really good. There's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's tech, Techno that's, Bowl that's... Arcade Football Unplugged from 2017. Yeah, that's the one. That is that now from football fans, mm-hmm. I have been told this is the game. This is way better than Blood Bowl. The seasons are better. The leagues are better. And well, it's not silly in fantasy. It's rated 8.6, yeah. but it's still only ranked at 30, 3,500 overall. I think a lot of people didn't like it. I don't know. Eight, I, 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 I rated 8.6. <laughs> yeah, 8.6 is yeah, really that's high. Really high. Uh, it was nominated for a Golden Geek and a Board Game Quest. It didn't win. Which is still pretty good. Dry erase football game. We played it as a kid. I don't know anything that's dry erase football game. Um, yeah. Bottom of the ninth is a really quick two-player baseball game. I actually I, at one time had two copies of that. Pat Kelly had the uh, the vibrating mm-hmm. football game. We used to play that over at his place. You can still get that. I've heard, the company yeah. that makes that is still around. Which is and such you can a get weird... custom custom teams and stuff. Yeah, that's that is such. I mean, it's really just like. You just vibrate it and watch it play, and it's like, oh no, he fell over. You stopped the vibrations and set yep. up again. It was that was a weird one. Yeah, I know, I've, I've heard of those. I've seen them over the years, but I've never actually played. Um, racing game automobiles, which is a bag builder, really solid bag builder actually. All the Stratomatic games, which I don't play. <laughs> that, that that's a lifestyle thing. If you get into Stratomatic games. I think they're stratomatic every sport, basically. Yeah. Um, did the gladiatorial arenas count? Arenas? <laughs> did Spartacus? 
Uh, off the top of my head, I think that's a yeah, Mons I, I own. I'm, I'm trying to think. I almost need to go downstairs and look around. I'm, I'm trying to picture my shelves and think if there's any sports games. D- and Dave's saying sports teams are one of the things that are much better as video games. And, and sometimes yeah. I agree. But when you get into some of the, the manager games, when you get like when you get into the, the sort of sports management type stuff, mm-hmm. then I think it does actually work rather well as a as a board game. Um, you can do a lot, especially like stats heavy games, right? If you've got a, a game like baseball, which is a very stat heavy game, uh, mm-hmm. you can do a lot with that in a board game. Oh yeah, that's that's the whole thing with the Stratomatic and that. Um, the one I want to try, Luchador. It's it's a dice game with with Mexican wrestlers. Yeah, you and I think the, you the literally Mexican throw the dice. Yeah, yeah. I think you actually we just sell them all the time. I sh- there are deals on Luchador on Amazon all the time, but I never played it. I just I know it because I share deals to it all the time. <laughs> Um, there was that heavy miniature game from Cool Mini or Not and Eric Lang, but that wasn't based on a real sport that flopped terribly. What was that called? Use D12s. Chaos Ball. Mm, yes. The fantasy sport of total domination. That was a complete failure. It was actually a surprisingly good game. Uh, again, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, ended up getting my copy of that and like going deep into it and buying expansions and stuff. I right. know what I still need to figure out. My dad had that golfing game. Mm. Oh, there, there, there's Let's Bowl a game from the 60s. <laughs> yeah. That was absolutely terrible. Yeah, That was yeah. one of the worst games I ever played my entire life. You said d- Dead Ball. And I thought you said Dread Ball, which is a thing. Like, there's a game called Dread Ball. And mm. it's, I don't know if it's popular or not. I just know it's a thing. <laughs> it's Dread Ball. And it was super minis, but it was... um. It, it was a miniature heavy game, like super miniature heavy game. I remember the Kickstarters and stuff. Yeah, Dreadball, the futuristic sports game. Two coaches compete for victory with teams of beautiful miniatures on a stunning sci-fi pitch. So yeah, when Donna said she backed Dr- Dead Ball, Dead Ball, I thought it was Dreadball, and I'm like, oh, they're reprinting Dreadball. Uh, they they did already, and the second edition for Dreadball came out in 2018. Yeah, it was, it was recently. <laughs> I thought I remember a recent edition of that. Yeah, and it was like super. Looked like it, and, and like the they got Etsy involved, like so, all these acrylic tiles yes, and stuff. Yes, lots of acrylic. Uh, but yeah, there was Dreadball, Dreadball Ultimate, and then Dreadball Second Edition. Wow, yeah. There, Deanna's like, how, how much is uh, Luchador on sale today? Forty-seven <laughs> percent off. You can get it for twenty-one bucks. There you go. But from what I understand, some of those physical ones, I, I don't know. There's like physical wrestlers. A wrestling There's, ring and wrestlers. See, I thought you threw the dice in the ring, but that's not what the back of this looks like. I don't know, I always look neat. It, it looked cool. Right. <laughs> I'm like, every time I sell a copy, I'm like, man, that was a, if Han Solo was, was around and the border was more open, I would have considered it. Mm-hmm. Man, I would have spent so much money on Prime Day or <laughs> considered spending so much. There were some really good deals. Nerds Day, too. Nerds Day was ridiculous. All right, well, let's, uh, Dave had a question for us yeah. in the Discord. What is the last game, board, RPG, card game, that you would say you had an in-depth mastery of? Perhaps a game where you were in the top 1% of players in that knowledge. Uh, so digging deep into one game versus playing a ton of different games, which is now, I think, more what you do than <laughs> yeah, more than anything Always, though, so. I, 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 I don't know. That's the difference between Deanna and I. I'm the Epicurean. I want to try new things. I've always been like that. Um, Talisman, second edition, is is at least one game. I don't know about the last game, but it's definitely one game that I had ridiculous amount of knowledge of. And then role-playing game would be Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay first edition. Yeah. I, I could have run that game without any books and like gotten the street names of Marienburg right and known the various... Like Most of this knowledge, I'll admit, is gone now um talisman i i don't know how many characters i had because i also had all the white dwarfs but like i didn't have to ask you what your powers were i didn't have to read the board ever i rolled the dice and knew what was going to happen like i knew every spell in the deck and i would know if people are holding on to spells because we'd cycle the deck and i'm like nope someone's holding on to whatever could probably transmutation because i haven't seen it played yet and i knew exactly the odds of going into the talisman dungeon and there's only, I don't, actually only two cards worth getting in that entire dungeon so if someone else had already got one, then you didn't go in the dungeon. Like, and, and I knew that game way too well. So Talisman and Warhammer, there's a bit of an overlap there because I played both around the same time. And I've just never really been that competitive. I, I expect as a player, I probably knew Warhammer. Um, 
you know, well enough. At I least say, the background, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, between the background and, and you know, not necessarily, you know, needing the character sheet, understanding the roles, the crit mm-hmm. tables, and, you know, the player aspects of that game yeah. uh, and the crunch involved in that game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I knew yeah. that one. But uh, I had the entire critical hit table memorized. Like for all the different each limb, like I, yeah. I knew them all. Like there's only six for each, right? There's legs, arms, head, chest. I think those are all of them. And there were six for each. So it's not like it was it wasn't like the roll master critical hit charts, but I still knew most of the text verbatim, right? By chance, one of your your arrow pierce what is it? Your arrow pierces into your opponent's side. By chance, one of the bone fragments severs a major artery, death from shock and blood loss is almost instantaneous. At least part of that is perfectly right. The, yeah. the, the, by chance, a bone fragment severed a major artery, death by shock and blood loss, is, is instantaneous. It was an actual quote from part of at least one of them. Oh, yeah. And, and if you got a, if you rolled a six on the head, you actually rolled to see where the head landed as it rolled so many yards away. Yep. That was definitely it. Um, modern games. Yeah, it's nothing for me. I got I really I, got to say nothing. Like, I, I don't know, Azul, but like I never, everyone knows, like there's not anything to know. <laughs> like I, I can teach it like, I don't know, it gets into like games I can teach without referencing a rule book. I could definitely do that one. Um, Race for the Galaxy up to a point. Race for the Galaxy, the first three expansions. I have played over 100 games. So and I know card counts and I know what to watch for. And I know that there's three of the genes cards in the deck, but I wouldn't say top 100 one percent. I'm probably in top 20% with Race for the Galaxy. And again, only with the first three expansions. Once you go past that, I got no clue. Right. I'm trying to think if there's others. Warhammer was definitely the RPG. Cyberpunk 2020, I was up there. But again, I wouldn't be in top 1% because I didn't own anything. No. Warhammer, I owned every book that was published. And now finally have the one that wasn't published. Because they finally published it years later. But I don't know that book, actually. The, my 1E Warhammer knowledge does not expand to the realms of sorcery because I got it long after I'd stopped running the game. Well, yeah. Um, TSR Marvel Superheroes, I was up there. But again, I didn't own every module, every expansion. I I could never find a copy of the Ultimate Powers book, which is the rarest book in the set. So I'm like, I knew it well. I could run it. I had the universal chart memorized, but I didn't have it memorized in the fact that like, if you had an exceptional and you rolled a 92, well, that'd be, okay, that'd probably be a red. But if you rolled a 33, I couldn't tell you if that was a success or not. I would have had to still look up the chart. So to me, that doesn't put me in the top 1%. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Games we've mastered. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can't think of really anything modern. Like Magic the Gathering. I was a, a judge at tournaments. But that's that's like going back to revised time period. Yeah, where I mean, like I knew like section three point six point two of the rules and all the timing and how I'd artifact. So at one time, yes, Magic the Gathering in the revised era of Magic the Gathering, up until Ice Ages, I could run tournaments and be uh whatever. But that, what do you but call that got it? knocked the, out pretty fast because I mean that game just evolved so fast if you didn't stay up, and they they don't had they didn't have the digital version to to be able to stay up and play all try all the new cards and see all the new yeah. combos and things. So yes, at different. one time. At one time, Magic the Gathering. To the fact I knew every card and what every card did, like I, I, there was never the oh, let me read that card. No, I. <laughs> there was a period of time when I got into Magic. That was that you know it's that that the happy spot where it's early university where like your courses are hard but not too hard, and you have free time and you have lots of time between your classes because they're at stupid times where like you got to be there at eight a.m. and your next course is at four p.m. and you're like, what do I do all day? Well, we played Magic or read Scry magazine or <laughs> whatever. That's what we did. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, do we want to do one more or not? I'm thinking we might want to save this for something else. Yeah, it's a it's a for next time. That, oh, that, that's a heavy one i think we'll save for another episode yeah, dave's saying i mastered magic five years after you <laughs> yeah see five years so I, I think we can do this little one because that that but i think we'll skip sorry axe we're going to skip your heavier question we're going to do this this one yeah so um and this will probably be the last question if anyone's got anything quick they want to throw in feel free uh so uh Hello there, 100 asked, in regards to your episode on copyright, are shapes, letters, and numbers of bicycle playing cards copyrighted? Okay, I don't know if it's copyrighted. I'm just going to say protected because I never remember what falls under copyright, what falls under IP, and what falls under trademark. The 
52 cards, the numbers, the symbols, ace, jack, spade, whatever, all those, you can do whatever you want with. That's all in the public domain. Specific fonts and specific changed symbols. So if like someone does their hearts different than a standard heart, and of course the card backs are protected because that's artwork. Yeah, so generally speaking, um, as, a, as a general rule, and this is coming from stock art photo uh, uh, photography sites who have to pay a lot of attention to what is copyrighted mm -hmm. and trademarked because they can't sell a stock art photo if there is a protected item inside the image. Uh, and so the backs of cards are pretty much right out. Assume that everything on the back of a card is protected at some, by something. Um, the Joker, the Ace of Spades, and any uh, of the face suits which are non-standard, which you look at the go, and if you look at it and go, oh, that's interesting, it's probably protected. And it's, yeah. if it's not just your standard Jack, Swing, Jack Queen, King. Um, that's yeah. the it's the joke. No, that's ace. the art for those characters, yeah. not the, the J. No, but even even the art is generally not protected. If you look at it and go, oh yeah, that's just yeah, I've, I've seen I've seen that jo that Joker or that Jack a million times. Yeah, the times. whole yeah, the suicide the Jack. Jack and the yeah. yeah. But uh, if if you look at it and go, oh, that's interesting, then it's art and it's going to be protected. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, the Jack, the Ace of Spades, the card backs. Um, and then potentially any faces. But when it comes to just the number and the symbol in the corner, oh. almost where the, the card layout, the card design, the deck composition, all of that is public domain at this point. Yep. You can go make your own deck or whatever you want, uh, which is why you see lots of decks out there that aren't bicycled. There are tons of companies out there reusing it. Um, as for the mechanics of the games, those are not protected either, but at episode we get into lots of detail <laughs> about that aspect of it yep so you're free to do whatever you want with those cards yep no absolutely but yeah if it's artwork if, if it's unique right so yep. every deck of cards has the same thing in it that the stuff that's the same in every deck of cards is for use that's why it's being used so often yeah but the actual artwork on the cards and again like if you do a funky a for the ace or if you're use a specific font for the two that can be protected yeah so what and i mean even the fonts generally are licensable um sort of things i think a lot a lot of this what comes comes down to is a lot of people are trying to make a game and they want to use a deck of cards but they don't want to make one from scratch because that's a lot of work and you know the default ones from microsoft look like garbage so they would love to be able to scan in their favorite set of bicycle cards yeah. uh, and they can except for the Joker and the Ace of Spades. And so as long as you make, as long as you, you know, take a look at them, most of those cards, you're probably fine. Uh, and then just, you'll have to adapt anything that, that is clearly original art. Yep. Or potentially, not even clearly, potentially original art. Yes, <laughs> potentially. Potentially. So yes, I uh, can't copyright mechanics, can copyright. Well, again, I, I don't remember the term. Arts, is art covered under copyright? Uh, art, is under, well, art, art is covered under copyright, um, but it's also it can also be copied under trademark. Uh, right. Copyrights expire. Trademarks need to be removed, renewed, but can continue on forever, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 bicycle symbol of their company logo, that yeah, is a the, trademark the speed. That is a trademarked piece of art uh, that is uh, renewed underneath their uh, company name. All right, we answered a few questions there. I think we're probably pretty good to move on unless you got something else. No, I think that's about it. So that is it for tonight's AMA. Thank you, everyone, who gave us questions to ask. Hope to see you all back here next week for our fourth anniversary episode. <laughs> and questions to answer, not questions to ask. I don't know if that was yeah. me or you, but whatever. We know what we're here for. We're here to answer your Game game night questions every week. Well, most weeks, pretty much every week. We don't miss that often. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Hello, and welcome to our review of Gunkimono, an abstract strategy game set in feudal Japan. Gunkimono was designed by Jeffrey D. Allers and features some gorgeous artwork from George Salas, graphic design by Melanie Graham, development by Daniel Fregman, 
Prem Gen, sorry, with Dustin Swartz doing the editing. This tiling game was published by Renegade Game Studios and is a re-implementation of the 2009 Pegasus Spiel game Heartland by the same designer. Sadly, this game is currently out of print, not even listed on Renegade's website, but it did have an MSRP of $40 and can still be found at most online stores and probably at your local game store. Now, I do wonder myself, this is without any research, if the use of certain fonts and images on this game may have been problematic as a product from persons with no Japanese heritage. However, as an abstract game, it's not clear that there was any need to make use of the imagery they did. But it was a choice. Now, in Gunkimono, you take on the role of a daimyo using a variety of various unit types to expand your control over the Japanese countryside. It features endless battles, betrayals, and tests of loyalty. Who am I kidding? This is a domino-based abstract strategy game with a cool but very pasted-on theme. Each turn, you place a two-sided tile on the board and either improve your honor, going up on one of five tracks, or you score points for each orthogonally adjacent connecting tile of the same color. Get your honor up high enough and you can place strongholds, which will score you points for the territories you are in every round. It's also bonus points for reaching the ends of the honor tracks, and that's about it. Gunkimono translates in English into War Tales. And very loosely, that's apparently the story you're telling on the board as you expand your reach. But as much as we admittedly don't talk enough about theme at times, there's nothing at all linking the game to the graphic designs and art. Yeah, interestingly, I, I didn't catch the, the full name. The full title of the game is Gunkimono War Tales. You can actually see it right on the right on the box front there. Um but Board Game Geek, all the online stores, and even Renegade Games, when they had the game in stock, just listed it as Gunkimono. Uh, so for a look at the basic but cool components you get in this game, check out our Gunkimono unboxing video on YouTube. Now here, for me, the components are just like a step above perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with them. The tiles you're placing are thick cardboard, and they are distinguished both by color and by artwork. The board is functional, if a bit larger than it needs to be. Now, what puts this a little step above the fact that, that just fine is the fact that the scoring markers for each player are actually little unique samurai meeple, and you get a cool wooden katana as a first player marker. Those are just little things that they didn't need to do that I thought were cool touches. Standard meeple would have worked just fine. Uh, the rules here are extremely well written and simple enough that you could easily just sit down, crack this open for the first time, read the rules for the first time you're sitting down to play. The big complaint I have isn't with the quality, but the chosen colors. This game is not friendly to certain types of colorblindness. As well, the graphics, while interesting and different, are very busy. And this, too, can impact your play with the level of visual noise present on the board in front of you. So what's interesting about that, actually, is my youngest daughter, who does have some processing issues, including visual processing, found the game hard to look at. She actually found the board difficult. It hurt her eyes. And that so doesn't surprise me at all, It is definitely honestly. a problem. So now that we have an idea of what you get and what the game is about, how about you walk us through how to play? All right, to start a game at Gunkimono, everyone picks one of the five player colors. They place the little Samurai Meeple at zero on the score track, place two strongholds on the honor track in the appropriate spot based on the number of players. Each player also collects one of each color of single square tiles. These each feature two honor tokens on them and are, of course, just one half of a full tile. Now, the standard two part tiles are shuffled. Some tiles are removed at random with playing with less than five players. You then take out five of the tiles, mm -hmm. shuffle in the end of game Gunkimono tile, and put that stack off to the side. Now, there's a nice special tile to put on top of this so you don't get it mixed in with your regular tiles. Finally, three tiles from the supply are placed face up, and players draw three tiles off of the stack. So everyone starts with a hand of three tiles. Now, the board in Gunkimono is an uneven grid of squares made up of the five different unit types or the five colors in the game. On your turn, you're going to take one of your tiles and place it on the board so that you can't cover up a square of the same color with your tile. So you can't place a yellow on a yellow or an orange on an orange. You then are going to score your tile. You're going to score both halves of it each separately. So for each half, you can gain honor, 
going up on the honor track based on how many stronghold symbols are on the tile, or you can score points. And the way you score points is you're going to get a point for that tile and any connected adjacent tile, and that's orthogonally. So if you're connected to two other tiles and they're connected to tiles, you're basically going to scare, score any area of the same color. Now, again, remember, you make this decision separately for each of your tiles. So you could score with both, you could get honor with both, or you can mix and match. Now, you also have the option, instead of playing one of the double tiles, to play your single square tile. These can be used to score points or go up in honor just like normal. Finally, you can actually use your single square tiles as a supporting unit, it's called. You're going to flip it over and you're going to place it on the board so it creates a level area for you to play on. So now all of this would be making way more sense if you could actually see the tiles as Mo described yeah. them. The rules are really simple to grasp once you have the components in front of you. Now, when we say this is an abstract game, we weren't kidding. The game basically only needs dominoes with different colors at either end and either one or two pips on each of those colored sides. Yeah. And That's again, it. like the unit types, like, yes, there's archers and there's spearmen and there's mounted cavalry. All that matters is you're grouping them together. Now, after placing your tile and getting your honor or points, you check to see if you have enough honor to earn a stronghold. You get these for having a set amount of honor in all five colors with the amount needed varying based on the player count. If you can place a stronghold, you pick one area of connected squares on the board that are all the same color and you put your stronghold on. From that point on, no other player can add to that area, and you can only score add to it to score honor. But at the end of every single round in the game, you're going to get points for every square in your stronghold's areas. Now, in addition to this, you can also earn bonus points by hitting the top of the honor track in each of the five colors. Uh, these are represented by tiles, and there's three levels of tiles worth descending points. So the first one to get to the end of a track is going to get the better tile, whereas the third person is going to get the worst tiles. And anyone after the third person is going to get nothing for hitting the end of the track. Now, each of these tiles are grouped in five point ranges. so You never know exactly how many you've got, and you're not allowed to reveal them to the end of the game. So it's one way so you don't necessarily know. You don't have that perfect information of knowing exactly what everyone's score is, which is actually something I appreciate. Now, once your turn is done, if you did play a tile, you're going to select a new tile, either from the three face up ones or from the face down stacks. If you take a face up one, you replace it. Now, a game of Gunkimono ends at the end of the round where the Gunkimono tile was drawn. Remember, you had set five tiles aside and shuffled it in at the beginning of the game. At this point, players flip over those bonus things and add them to your score, and whoever has the most points wins. Well, now that you have a pretty a good idea of how to play, let's move on to what we thought of this abstract strategy game. So I feel I need to start by calling out the theme and the total, complete lack of connection to the gameplay. Like, this is a chess level of abstraction. No one playing chess actually feels like they're recreating a battle on a battlefield. In no way do I feel like I'm playing a domio or controlling troops at all. This is a pure abstract all the way. And I've got to say, the farming theme of the game that was in the original Heartland fits better, because I can at least see trying to put similar plants together way more than I can just grouping my tiles. So I admit, I, if it was a game about grouping plants, I probably never would have tried this game. So I guess the theme did something there. Yeah, as I mentioned, I don't really see, see the theme anything other than as a marketing tool. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you could sell this as a clean, modern design with bright, solid colors and zero art. Uh, I, I think of it almost as like an executive desk game, a little on the yeah. big side. But, you know, with those those really clean, crisp colors, solid, yeah. solid pieces. Yeah. You might even be able to recreate this with like something like Quirkle style tiles, right? Mm -hmm. Like make it very clear. Stars, circles, squares, hexagons. It would actually probably be easier to look at than this. Oh, I like Samurai and it looks cool. So I don't know. Uh, to be fair, theme doesn't actually matter, right? This is an abstract strategy game. How much of the theme really matter? The gameplay is in this more than makes up for the lack of theming. This is a very solid, surprisingly deep abstract strategy game. It does the thing that all good abstract strategy games do by being simple to learn, but difficult to master. Absolutely. Despite the sort of negative aspects I pointed out and feeling I may have given, I really enjoyed playing this <laughs> at multiple player counts mm -hmm. and saw a number of different ploys and strategies to try out as the play evolved. 
Now, this is one of those games where the more you play it, the more you realize just how things work and things interact. You're going to discover new strategies. And I think the most important thing in this game that takes you a bit to get used to is figuring out the perfect time to do things. Like, do you build on a color and keep adding to it, hoping to chain it for multiple turns? You know, get five points this turn, six points next turn, eight points next turn. But if you do that, you risk someone throwing a stronghold on it and taking it and then getting those points every turn going forward. And then when to place your strongholds, do you try to get it out as soon as you can at the very beginning of the game? So you're scoring those bonus points almost passively for the rest of the game. Yeah, but as soon as you put your stronghold out and Deanna has totally called it, the first person to get their stronghold out gets screwed over. The other players are going to cut you off as quick as they can. And you're going to have a stronghold out there getting one point every turn for you. And it's decisions like this that honestly keep bringing me back. It's what engages me when I play Gunkimono. And a lot of it depends on how much time you want to spend thinking. If you want to track what colors the other players are picking up to think about what they have mm -hmm. in their hands and work out the odds of the different ploys that they could go on and whether or not you think they have the green that could go down here mm -hmm. and expand. But that will really stretch out game time. Yeah, this game, uh, the AP is possible. I will just say it could go either way and I've seen it go either way. Now, another thing I appreciate about Gunkimono is how well it plays at all player counts. This is a game that plays two to five players, which I actually forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about the game. Uh, two to five players, and at two, it's a very different game from the other player counts. It's, it's very cutthroat, and it plays really quick, like to the point of almost becoming a thinky filler. I think Deanna and I finished the game in under 20 minutes at one point, just playing back and forth. And also at two players, because the board doesn't change much between turns, you can do that long-term planning. You can be like, I'm going to play this style, then I'm going to play this style, then I'm going to do this, and well, I'll adapt if I have to. It wasn't for the size of the board. This would be in our list of games to bring, like keep in the van and bring with us when we go to pubs or coffee shops or whatever. But that board's a little too big for your average coffee shop. This would be in, in, in there with Oni Tom and the Duke for us. Now, while I do dig it at two, it really got better once you throw in three. Once you throw in that competition, there's just more interesting interactions. You've got players cutting each other off. Um, the board becomes more three-dimensional, because I don't know if you could get that when I was describing the game. You are playing stacks on top of stacks, and the board can get pretty high in a way with it. And you get more of that with three players. Um, this continues with more, even more, right? When you go with the four players, there's more tiles in play, and five, there's a ton of tiles in play. And five players really changes things because as you add players, the strongholds come out easier. At five players, you get your first stronghold by having one honor in all of them. You get your second stronghold by having two honor. If you play properly, you can unlock all of those by turn five. Because you can just play a two, a two, a two, a two. Uh, you might even be able to pull it off earlier if you combo it right. I don't know. I've, I've, I've only played five players once, I will admit. Um, the problem, though, five players was just a bit too much. It worked. It, it was totally serviceable. It The didn't, game didn't break. But time, the AP, the time between turns got rather long. Just waiting for five other people to plan out what they're doing. And what made it really bad, well, worse. I shouldn't say bad. Again, it's not bad. But what made it worse was the amount of thinking because you couldn't plan ahead. The board changed way too much. Four other players doing things and changing things, it was almost impossible to do that three move ahead plan. By the time it got to your turn, most of the time, that first step of that three move plan was gone. That spot had been taken. Someone else noticed it. Someone else took it. And then so you're like, oh, we got to play quick. Be ready to play on your turn, right? That's what everyone tells everyone who has AP. Be ready to play as soon as it's your turn. Well, that can't happen when what you just did totally invalidated what I was planning. Now I got to rethink everything and recount everything and think about what tiles you drafted last turn and what I should do next. So, yeah, and, and Board Game Geek really backs this up with four coming in as the as uh, voted as the best player count, which right. really does seem to match your experiences. Now, not loving the game at five is really the only thing bad I have to say about this game. Overall, Kimono is an excellent abstract strategy game, easy to learn, easy to play, but has plenty of engaging decision points to engage even the most hardcore gamers. This is one of those games my kids could sit and play on their own, but I could also sit down with the local chess master Charles and have fun playing him in a cutthroat two-player game. If you dig abstract strategy games, you owe it to yourself to try to sink, seek out a copy of Gunkimono. 
As noted earlier, sadly, it's currently out of print and has completely vanished from Renegade's website, which leads me to think there's no reprint coming. So if you do find a copy now, you should probably want to pick it up. With how much we've been enjoying it, though, I do hope some publisher grabs it and gets it back in print. This has all the makings of an evergreen abstract. So it could be up there with games like Azul. Now, do make sure you take a look at it, though. Maybe check it out on Board Game Geek, because if you do have any vision issues, you wouldn't want to be picking it up and struggling with any of those uh, concerns. Totally fair. Maybe we'll get a new printing with clearer distinction between the five unit types or whatever we're going to call them, five different actions. Now, if you're not into abstract strategy games, you're probably going to want to avoid this one. Um, the cool samurai theme isn't really going to be enough to sell this game. And despite the war theme, there's no war game here. This is a domino based area building game, not the mass battle game it claims to be. Though the Katana first player token is pretty neat to have. Yeah, I got to say that this is one of the best first player tokens I've seen in a game. Now, before I go, I do want to take a moment to talk a bit about the one expansion that exists for Gun Kimono, and that is the Double Army Tiles. Now, these were released as part of the Level Up loot box from Renegade, and that's one of those you get a box and it's got a bunch of little things for a bunch of different games. I was also being given away as promos at cons before that. Now, these tiles feature only one color on both halves of the tile. The honor tokens match the existing ones, though. So one one has one token, the other side has two tokens. Now, to use these at the start of the game, you get two random tiles from the supply and then one of these again at random. So you don't know what it is. That's it. That's how you set up. Now, what these do is they give you a big step up, a big bonus in one color that may not match your player color, which is worth noting. Like just because you're playing yellow doesn't mean you get the yellow tile. This gives you the ability to, in one move, gain three honor with one tile or gives you the ability to a score a large area twice because you still resolve this two colored tile both halves separately. So you score one than the other. Note, I have no idea how available these are, but I did want to mention them tonight since we're talking about the game. Why not talk about the expansion? These aren't anything needed to me. These are a perfect promo. It's something kind of cool to add to the game, but I there's no FOMO, I think, with these. You're not missing out by not having them. They're just kind of neat to have. Uh, and I actually saw them going on uh, the uh, secondary market for like eight bucks plus shipping. So and that's that seems pretty good. Yeah. So that's it for our review of Gunkimono, an abstract tiling game set in feudal Japan. Theme isn't everything. What's a game you dig where the theme is barely tied to the mechanics? Tell us about it in the comments below. I also invite you to check out my written review of Gun Kimono on the Tabletop Bellhop blog. All right. Now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so it's been a couple weeks um, since we were here, and in that time, Sean was down for an evening, and we got in quite a few uh, games in, uh, starting with Gun Kimono. Um, we just finished reviewing it. I don't think there's too much more to say, but do you have anything to say about Gun Kimono we didn't get to in the review? I mean, not really. I, you know, it's a fun game. It's over-designed, and uh, someone should really come out with a pure, you know, sort of uh, color, you know, purely color version, modern aesthetics, you know, where it's it's just, you got a, you got a domino that's one half solid yellow and one half solid red, you know, get that real neat. Uh, I think you still modern. need the symbols though. You got to worry about color blindness if you just do color. You still need color and symbol, but I think just doing a, a very solid like square circle triangle star kind of thing in colors might be a little better. I don't know, I dig it. Um, we played it with the family. We played it with the kids. Uh, again, my daughter, my youngest daughter, who has uh, has a visual um, problems, visual processing disorder, um, did have a little difficulty seeing the tiles. Um, also with the levels, which is something you wouldn't necessarily think of, but being able to tell which tiles were actually level or not. She had a hard time. Like she'd go to place tile and be like, oh, it's not level. There were, so you there know what, honestly, uh, in our three player game, there were a couple of times where I sort of had to, you know, move my head and look for shadows sort of thing yeah. uh, depending on the lighting that can be that can be a problem now one thing you called out and i think i agree i think this game would be fantastic on board game arena yeah. i would probably have a game going all the time if this was on board game arena yeah, absolutely so after teaching a gun kimono i brought a revolution of 1828 this is a two-player Steffenfeld game based on the historic u.s election 
Uh, this is a game I personally would have never touched or tried if I didn't get it in a lot when I bought a bunch of games all at once. Uh, this is a theme that does nothing for me as a Canadian. I don't really care all that much. Um, but like Gunkimono, the theme really doesn't matter much here. So I think it kind of ties in well with our current topic. Uh, this is an abstract tile drafting area majority game at its heart and not so much a historical recreation in any way. So what do you think of Revolution of 1828? There are so many things about this game that, that kind of turned me off. Uh, the look and the theme do nothing for me. I honestly can't think of a less interesting topic to a non-American. Uh, and I could possibly go on, but we don't like to get too political. So uh, nothing about this was a game I would ask to play or pick up and look at on a store shelf. Mm, the problem is, that's a shame. Because it's actually a really fun and interesting two-player game. Uh, there's quite a bit of strategy and thinking to it. And the potential of cascading actions mm -hmm. can really sort of get your brain into a knot if you try to dig too many actions deep, trying to think about all the repercussions of every action you do. Uh, I still don't care at all about the theme. But yep. as a game, I'd be up to play it again happily. Yeah, this is one I wish had a retheme. Maybe it maybe it attracts uh, uh, the there are people who are interested in this theme. But like, come on, Phil, put out I don't know. You like to do Arthurian games? Put out an Arthurian version or something. I don't know. I I, I don't know how you'd retheme it though. Like, I, oh, to be honest, it's tied to the theme better than Gunkimono. But like, at least you're collecting votes. <laughs> like, at least that seems kind of the way you collect votes and electors. But th there's nothing in Gunkimono. There's a, it, it's it's a stretch. We'll say in this one, but yeah, I'm I exactly the same. I don't know if we're ever going to do a formal review of this. It, it's like I said, something from my personal collection. I fear talking about it here is probably good enough. But if we ever do a formal review, it's going to get be very similar to Gun Kimono and a you know abstract strategy that works really well, pretty simple to learn. But man, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Now I'm going to go out of order a bit because I want to save a particular game for for last. Um, we also played a three player game of Scythe. Uh, it was Deanna, myself, and Sean, and I think that went over well. Um, on my end, I think I've gotten a lot better at teaching the game now that I'm five plays deep. Um, I think I've managed to figure out all the things that need to be highlighted for people to be able to play Scythe effectively, uh, and there's unfortunately a lot of those. Um, it, this way, people, I, I can kind of give them a direction so you're not just fumbling around at the beginning, which I think helps. Um, I do admit there were a couple things I did forget during the teach. So one of those, you know, we're playing partway through and I'm like, oh, right, the factory. You know, that keeps still happening. Um, there's just oh, so much going on in that game. Now, like me, I know you were not a huge fan of Scythe after your first try. Um, have you come over to the dark side? Uh, potentially. <laughs> so I will say that with the three of us, I had enough fun that I came home, reinstalled the digital version and played it again within 24 hours. And I've been doing that thing where you think about what you could have done differently and what might have worked sign. better. Uh, and specifically, which board uh, on the bottom side would have made my life easier. <laughs> uh, I will almost certainly want to play this one again in person. Uh, maybe, I, you know, at the very least, maybe if we get an expansion to uh, swing down and, and get that out on the table again. Uh, one thing I note, um, and I don't know if this is covered in your copy or not, uh, the video, the, the digital version has an option to check off uh, and to eliminate the possibility of certain board combinations because it is found oh, to no. be, uh, it's like, it's, it's like other Jamie's other games, you know, uh, we, don't, yeah, like we think this is bad. We think this is bad. So don't play, don't play it with this combination of boards. Interesting. Uh, okay. And there's a couple of those that the, the digital game will just rule out. If you check the box, I might have to look into that because I have no idea if that's in Patra plays. I don't feel we delved deep enough. I've never felt <laughs> like anyone was overpowered. I don't, I don't think we're quite at that level yet. Right. We're, <laughs> we're definitely, there's too much going on in that game to notice. I, heck, I haven't even noticed a single faction winning more often at this point or anything like that. So, yeah, if it's there, still good to know that they've at least covered that. There was nothing included in my box. Right. If there was no sheet to reference, there was no like like tapestry actually comes with a the revised. I forget yeah, yeah. what they call them, the modifications for the different um, civilizations. There's nothing like that in my copy. Of side. It was interesting with the, uh, um, the I had the same problem. I lost the same way uh, by not getting any hearts, basically. Yeah. Um, in, in my digital play, but I was aware of it 
and I was, I, but at the same time, I didn't know how to compensate for it. So I, I need to. Yeah. Popularity I, I, is, is yeah. surprisingly important in that game. But at the same time, you also need to spend popularity to do certain things. So yeah, it's yeah, I, I, that's that's what I need to work on. Is is you can work popular on being more leader. popular. <laughs> how how do I become popular? Just don't put as many workers out. Yeah, try to get true. by with less. I don't know. <laughs> get to the factory right away and find whatever you can that will give you popularity. Uh, again, jumping kind of out of order here. So Deanna and I spent last night in Kingsville. Um, sorry to say there wasn't as much gaming involved as we had hoped. Uh, sadly, the room we regularly stay in at N31 no longer has a game worthy table on it, um, which stinks because it's one of the reasons we actually stay in that particular room every time we go. Like Deanna does the research to figure out, yep, there's a table we can play Gorian games on. So we are going to stay there. Um, honestly, we both kind of independently reached out to Jax and they were very apologetic, uh, noting they had a rambunctious patron that caused the demise of the table. Um, they do promise there'll be one next time we're back. So looking forward to that next time, getting some games in. Um, note, we did play one game because we went to the Banded Goose Brewery where we played an entire full 500 point game of Racco. Because that's now our tradition. We go to Banded Goose, we drink their fantastic craft beer and play Racco. Um, I ended up winning it with a very small amount of points. It was a very close game, actually. And they still haven't fixed the two. <laughs> three. It's three. the three. Three. Yep, it's the three. All right. Uh, do you want to get on this next, or do you want to talk about your other thing first? Uh, you know what? Let's talk. I can jump ahead. So, yeah. Uh, this uh this week, I finally got a chance to sit down with the Master's Toolkit from ArkenForge.com. Uh, now we were given. Uh, they reached out to us after seeing our video about uh map making software, and they yeah. reached out to us and they said, you know, look, can we can we let you uh, play with our software and see if it's worthy of inclusion on your list. Um, and so we said, sure, absolutely. Uh, now, I was admit, I was a little put off by this at first. Uh, it started off because it's a U Unity, um, Unity platform project, which has a sort of feel to it that you, you kind of, it, it feels like, a, oh, I don't know how to program, so I've, I've just used this shell and done a bunch of default stuff. And, and that kind of put me off. Uh, and then when they gave me the packs, I installed them using the launcher and it was not quick. And I, it, the, mm. the, watching the bars, and then I realized that the, it was installing 19 gigs of Whoa. content. It wasn't slow because it was slow. It was slow because they gave me a massive amount of so content. So they basically gave you everything? Not even close. That's oh, the amazing wow. thing. So uh, what I believe they gave me is about $70 US worth of content, which is $35 worth of uh, fantasy and $35 worth of sci-fi. Again, US dollars. Okay. Uh, there are no subscription fees. Uh, when you buy one of the content packs, it gives you the software that you use to deal with all this stuff. Uh, so it does require Windows uh, and a graphics card. Onboard graphics doesn't cut it. Because this uh, is a 3D dungeon, right? Like these aren't tiles. This is uh, it's well, it's tiles like, plus. Okay. Um. So, uh, they have tutorials and manuals, and the software even actually has a touch version for running. If you want to run minis out on a tablet on on oh, the okay. uh, on the table. Um. So, being me, I wanted this to be easy, uh, especially because part of what we were doing in our original video was, you know, yeah, cheap and easy, easy ways free, to, yeah. <laughs> to do to do maps. Uh, now, so we'd already blown past the free. This wasn't free, but 35 bucks for fantasy is, is pretty decent. Uh, so I just opened up a map and started going. I did not look at a tutorial. I did not look at the instructions. I just said, OK, you know what? If I'm going to make a map, it should be really easy to slap down some grass, make a path, put in some trees, you know, simple, yep. simple, basic fantasy map. So it turns out it's actually a little harder than I thought it or thought it would be, but for a good reason. So there's okay. a there's a, a sort of, you know, a tree based list of all the stuff. Well, the problem is it's just too big. Again, 19 much gigs stuff. of content. So I was struggling to find, you know, grass. Now, luckily, right. I took me a couple of seconds and I realized that there is a search bar right at the top. And if you type okay. in grass, all of a sudden you get 14 different types of grass. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, and then you just 
drag and drop it on the map. Easy as that. As when you open up the map, you get to choose uh, your your style, so uh, your grid, whether it's hex or square, oh, your, that's cool. and whether the size of the squares and all that. So that's all preset nice. for you. And then you're basically just dropping all your content onto this grid, okay. shifting it around, rotating it easily. Um, now, one thing I noticed that I, again, I don't want to, I, I haven't fully delved into this. This isn't really a full review. Uh, I didn't, I, I couldn't find a snap to. So I, okay. it wasn't snapping to the grid the way I wanted it to. But that may be an option I just haven't found yet. Uh, then next, I typed in path, and I got like four different kinds of paths that were all uh, infinitely tileable, so that the like yeah. uh, the stone the stonework lined up and made for a constant path mm -hmm. across. Uh, I typed in trees, and it said, "Well, do you want a plain tree or an animated tree? And do you want okay. coniferous, deciduous, uh, like, you know, wow. all the different kinds of trees? Uh, and again, with animation or not." Uh, and then I said, okay, well, well, uh, well, let's throw, let's see if I can make a village. Well, there's pre-made multi-level building. So it's actually, it's oh, not, nice. it's not 3D, but it's layered. So you can step through okay. the layers of the, uh, of the buildings. Plus there's everything you need to build your own buildings on top of oh. it all. Uh, and the pre-made buildings come with uh, torch, torches placements, fireplaces, all with animated lighting. But actually ambient do ambient lighting okay. um there's a slider on one side so you can set the time of day and you can <laughs> actually scroll through the time of day and watch the entire map change time oh, wow. of day That's all of cool. your uh stuff going uh there's a full dungeon building section that i haven't even started looking at yet and this is just the fantasy pack the, That's you know, not even the sci-fi. i haven't even wow. i haven't even touched a sci-fi map yet um as well, there's Fog of War. And the interesting thing about Fog of War and this map, because there's two ways to use this. You can export the map and throw it into your own virtual tabletop or print it out or whatever. Or if you have the setup, uh, say if you have a projector or a you know, screen in your table, mm -hmm. you can use multiple monitors. So I can have the map creation screen up in front of me. Right. And basically build a separate window at a separate scale view with fog of war on it. That's being uh, sent out to a different right. monitor and I can paint out the fog of war as characters move. Um, and then in case this wasn't enough for your map software, it also comes with both ambient sound effects, soundtrack and soundboard sound effects. Wow. Okay. And all the ambient music was customizable. So like if you got if you went with the the bandits tavern, it would have like um, check boxes and sliders. All these basically. different, you know, yo, I don't want a barmaid. I do want mm -hmm. a horse in the background, and nice. you know how loud I want them to be, and, and all that sort of. So fully, plus there's just the the soundboard, so that if you've got you know your wizard spells or whatever, that's all available mm -hmm. to you. So it's nice. it's a full DMing system as well as a map making software. Eesh. And again, for 35 bucks, you get, it's a lot good. of content. So, so the big one I know people are going to want to know about is can you import? Can you add your own graphics, your own yes. sounds, or are you uh, stuck with what's yet. there? I have not gotten to that experimentation yet, but I know the feature is there. Is there? Okay. Because that's so, a big thing for people. They want to nope, be able to absolutely. put their own. And then I guess the other big one is can you export to Roll20? <laughs> because yes. so it is being its to, own. Yeah, it is exportable to all the, very, the, VT, the different VTTs. Yeah. Like, I realize it's supposed to be its own and it's a competitor yep. to Roll20, but a lot of people like Roll20. No, no, so. absolutely. I mean, I really, realistically, the, the, its own DM functions are only useful if you've got players at the table and a projector of some sort. Right. So um, it's not good for online gaming. If for online gaming, you're going to have to, you know, finish it off, export it, and deal with however the other system uh, does Fog of War and stuff like that. That's just Fair enough. how it is. All right, the last one, a, a kind of mini review here, a first thought, say, uh, I think we may have quite a bit to say about this one. Um, the other game we played this weekend, uh, the most complex game and the most uh, the, that we may share a lot about, I don't know how much we're going to say here today, I didn't even script this part, is we sat down and tried out, it was Sean, Tori, Cat, and I. Uh, Deanna was busy dealing with Game Nerds Nerds Day, which also went really well for us. And that is a board game called The Ghosts Betwixt. Uh, if you want to see what this game looks like, our 
unboxing video went live this week so you can find that on youtube now um for those of you who are here live last time we recorded i kind of showed off the box at the back and it's kind of behind me but it's flat so you can't actually really see it right here but this is a board game that looks like a saturday morning cartoon the the cover of the box the art the style of the game looks like honestly scooby-doo without without being Scooby-Doo with the numbers filed off. it's it, There's no dog, but it just has that kind of look. This is a modern, as in set in the modern time, not fantasy, not sci-fi, horror dungeon crawling game set in America's haunted heartland. You are investigating a haunted house. You are playing a family and your brother has gone missing. And that's all you know at the start of the game. So this one was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> We knew going in that it was a heavy game and it didn't match the look of the box oh. and, and the sort of the, what they were presenting. Um, we spent, I don't even know how long, punching the 11 boards yes. that came with it and sorting the cards and trying to figure out how the heck to organize it. It was a mess. It needs it, it, something. It, it trough insert to keep everything protected, which is fair, but like no baggies, no nothing. Know what I would love to start seeing in modern board games? Tell me how to organize your game. Yeah. Tell me how to group the components so that I'm ready to play. That is something you just don't see that I would love to start. We were talking about onboarding. Add that in. Just tell me how to organize this stuff. Because it ends up I had sorted cards wrong because I just opened everything at once and sorted by card back, which seemed to make sense to me. But it ended up we had cards that we shouldn't have unlocked in the game. Yeah, and and so, I mean, our guesses were wrong. Uh, they didn't yeah. give us any solution. Uh, even, even you know, we had one Plano, Plano box that we used to sort <laughs> it of just something. just happened to have, and yeah, it that worked. It, it still wasn't enough. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, see, I see people online talking about two specific Plano boxes to try and help, you know, wrangle this system. Like, uh, this was literally Gloomhaven level of stuff. Like, it's not nearly the size physical of books, but, like, take Gloomhaven, divide it by 10. Right, like you just have all these monsters st standees, and then you have different little plastic stands, and then you've got three different colors of item decks, and then or equipment decks, and then a deck of items, and then cards for each of the characters. Again, look at the unboxing video; just see the amount of stuff. So next, after after you get all the components put together, there are three count them three rule books. Well, uh, two rule books wow. and a scenario book. Books. Now, now you but read yes, these in advance, books. and then and, and I know I know from talking to D that this just reading them in its own was a bit of a uh, adventure. Yeah, unfortunately, the editing is not the best in this. Um, there were times it definitely felt like I was reading a prototype rule book. Um, there were some grievous uh, editing errors, like text written into a background image at one point, and it just it was rough. It was not an easy read but not terrible. Like, like this wasn't bad translation issues. The game was very playable. Everything was there somewhere. Um, it did have the best index I've ever seen in a game where they actually combined the index and the glossary, which I, again, I show this off in the, the unboxing, but it's fantastic because not only does it have like the term, I, I'm trying to think of any of the conditions in the game off the top of my head, and I'm drawing a blank. Exposed was one. No, there was crippled. Crippled was one of the status effects. If you look up crippled, it told you what page to read crippled, but it actually told you what crippled did right there on the index. And I thought that was brilliant. Um, but this there, was another. There were a couple of problems in that, too, as well, though, because when we looked, if you looked up uh, FM, it would say, you know, there'd be something for FM. But if you went to family member, it would say also known as FM. Like it didn't, it, you know, it didn't always have everything both ways. So yeah, if you, if yeah, you knew, didn't if you knew the long ways. form, it would be okay. But if you were yes. trying to figure out what the short form was, it wasn't always helpful sort of thing. And honestly, the number of acronyms was a little oh, ridiculous. It was. It <laughs> felt like it was written by a military person. I, I wouldn't be surprised if whoever <laughs> designed this was a, was a, uh, a military person. Uh, uh, from a military family because yeah they did love their acronyms yes there were a lot of acronyms and some of that was reading the book i was just like i don't even know what this means there's so many acronyms uh, another really frustrating part was in a way it's good and, and bad we've talked again about onboarding and how you know what more board games should do is come with their demo book that's what it felt like they did but that was the intro book you were supposed to learn the game from Whereas it seemed like a fantastic tool to teach the game once you were an expert at it. Because 
the thing was like, okay, do this out, sort these cards out, and then do this. See the other book to figure out how to do that. So you start playing, and then you grab the other book, and you read through a whole section, and then you jump back to the first book. You're like, okay, now that we have these cards done, now you're going to get to take your actions. Okay, see section three, four, five, six, seven, and 8 for the different action types. And then you go back to the other book, and you look them up. And I think if you had already internalized all these rules, it would be a great way to use to teach a new group the game. Like here as a demo player, do this, 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 and this. And all it did was basically set it up so that the first room in the first scenario wasn't random. So that you knew what room you were going to get and you knew what monsters you were going to get and what treasure you were going to get. That's all this did to make it a teaching experience. It didn't do anything else. It didn't really teach you how to play. It just kind of gave you a set thing. And we talked about it. A good demo, that's what you do. You stack the deck. And it kind of did that. But just the way it was presented was more frustrating than useful. It was jump between this book and that book and this book and that book. And in this case, you're using all three books because you're also setting up the scenario. So it's like jump to the scenario to figure out how to set up the next room. Then jump to the book to find out what that token you just flipped is. Then jump back to the playbook that or whatever the how to play book to figure out what the next step is and what you're supposed to do next. And I got to say, as a trying to sit down with three of us, four of us, sorry, Three, three other people and myself just trying to learn this. It was painful. Yeah, it was. And there was there was also things that it told you to do that were absolutely wrong. Yes. Um, it told yeah, you I to shuffle the, the deck specific, of cards. It, it told yeah. you to shuffle the monster deck, which was a complete and utter waste of time. Now, it didn't actively harm you. I will go that far. In that but, particular case, yes. But in, but in that particular case, it wasted your time because now instead of being able to just go through the deck, you had to sort through the whole deck because you'd shuffled a deck that was actually in order. Yeah. Um, and yeah, go ahead. So it was also just confusing for what to do with the different cards. And I feel we're being a little too negative. So I want to bring it back to the happy side. All this said, the game seems very neat. So first and foremost, though, it is not my first dungeon crawl. And I admit, I agreed to review this thinking it would be a dungeon crawl game I can play with my girls. Something that would be light Saturday morning cartoon, Scooby-Doo, um, something a step above Hero Quest. Not something that's a step down from Gloomhaven. And I'm not joking. This is, I, I would say this game is more complicated more things going on, more things to worry about, more things to track than Star Wars Imperial Assault. Some people on Board Game Geek are ranking this as lightweight game, and I'm wondering if they played it because I don't get it. I actually asked Sean, I'm like, go rank this a four or a five on weight because there's no way this thing should be showing as like a 1.26 weight. Like, it's just not a 1.26 weight. Yeah. This is a fully involved dungeon crawling game with randomly generated monsters, randomly generated dungeons, monsters that have random abilities, characters that level up through level one to seven, that get to pick unique skills that can be leveled up on their own. There's weapon proficiencies like this is an involved dungeon crawling game and it does not look like that now that said it's a fun dungeon crawler it's extremely well done i have to say i think one of the things that they have done especially well is their combat system so mm -hmm. their dice are all based on colors so we had a dice you know a dice roller with all the dice spread around the side and we could, you know, you pass it to somebody and you say, okay, what do we need? I need a green, a green, a light yellow, an orange, and the monster's blocking with a tan. And you grab those dice, you roll them, and in, you know, with a glance, you know whether you hit or not. Yep. And with a second glance, you know whether or not there's been, you know, how much damage you've done and whether there are any other effects. It's that simple. Um, despite mm -hmm. there being a, sometimes a good number of dice, and I'm sure as the campaign continues, the, the number of dice is only going to get larger. Yeah. It was just really easy and fun. And, you know, when it came to the, the combat, which is a, a large portion of any dungeon crawler, it was just straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, the monsters did what you expect them to do. Um, yeah, the AI in here the is AI was better easier than, than the, Gloomhaven. It was better than Gloomhaven. I don't know if Gloomhaven's is bad. It's easier. Yeah, easier than Gloomhaven. Uh, and it just sort of, it just kind of made sense what was going on. Um, there were a couple of strange things about, uh, you know, facing. Facing. See, <laughs> but, I, the, personally, that's a, 
to me that's going too far that's that's where i'm like okay you made the game too complicated yeah I, I have to worry about what side of my standees on and then there was some really wonky stuff where you could move diagonally but facing was orthogonal and i'm like why why wouldn't you just face diagonally as well like you're just th that was an evil uh, extra level of verisimilitude i don't need in my my games yeah. no that's fair but that's a choice like i i'm tempted though i don't know if it would break the game it would depend on the powers just throw out the facing rule just don't allow anything to backstab ever and then, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, the biggest thing was this dice system and, you know, you had, it was cards. So all your items were cards right in front of you and you just look down at, here's my player, here's my weapon, here's my ammunition. Those are the dice I get to roll. What's his, what's his color for block? Defense. I yep. add that, roll it and done. Uh, really, really super yep. straightforward. Stars hit, shields block, you know? Now, one thing we didn't get into, but I could see as part of the system is this system is very similar to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition or Star Wars Edge of the Empire, the Genesis dice system. And I can totally see those dice telling a story. Now, we were too focused on mechanics because <laughs> we were trying to learn the game, but I can totally see like he jumped out of the way or I hit because of this die. Therefore, I hit him with my baseball bat, not. I did this right. Or I hit because I buffed up and I took time to aim. Like you could literally get those story elements in there. Absolutely. Now, one thing I was extremely impressed by, and here's where the game may beat out big games like Gloomhaven or Jaws of the Lion or Imperial Assault is this seems infinitely replayable. There was no, like there's spoilers in that, you know, what's going to happen, but even like we played through most of scenario one, and then kind of look to see what the ending would be just as, so we could review it or talk about it here. This is, don't consider this a final review, please, um, so that we could talk about it here. But there was nothing there that now knowing it ruins anything. Like there was literally nothing in the first scenario. You're like, you, you go until you find a thing. And then once you find the thing, you go find some other thing. And those the, the thing with this is, is it's not set scenarios, not set maps. It's not set monsters. It's randomized. So there is no reason not to play scenario one 20, 30 times because every time it's going to be a different experience. Yeah. And that's without taking to the fact that you scenario one, it'd probably always be pretty close to the same, but you're going to level up your characters different. You're going to take different talents. You're going to take heck. There's even a thing where you go shopping at the start of the game where you could take different equipment the next time you play and you can try different builds. And again, how do I have a weight one game with different builds so that that BGG <laughs> weight needs to be fixed? Yeah, it's still sitting at 2.8 in these, uh, you know. That's better. That's better. that's at least better. 2.8 is uh, definitely better. But yeah, no, it's it's definitely got me to it. Uh, and again, I posted this on Twitter, you know, like the next night. Um, to me, what this, what this game screams to me, which is the same problem we've had on other games lately and is, is becoming a frustrating problem, is these games behave like their manuals have never been blind play tested. Yep. These have never been given to someone completely unassociated with the game who doesn't know anything about it and told, OK, play this game now. Yep. Because and the doing that in a vacuum yeah. without the designer watching or teaching or correcting or fixing. Yeah. Because there I mean, we we went to Board Game Geek and the list. I mean, this game just came out. Um, it's only really in people's hands recently. And the number of questions already there is significant and while yes i appreciate uh dustin being in those forums and helping people out mm -hmm. and being active in the community that's great but if the manual had been written properly he wouldn't need to be as active yeah. um and, yeah, this and, is one I'm, I'm hoping they're gonna put out a two, like a, at least a 1.2 yeah because right the now the version they, it was all the set at version one and those are three years old so those are you know these these have not changed since they got into uh people's hands yeah note this was a kickstarter that was yep. three years ago and they put up the rule book back then yeah they, they, overall though like it shows a lot of promise but it wasn't what i wanted at all and yeah, i'm it's... not disappointed but it just it wasn't what i thought we were agreeing to review and that that's that's possibly somewhat on me because i didn't do enough research well, but like I, everything about is... this game says intro to dungeon crawling it's also i mean this game is listed on the box as ages 10 plus you can play at 10. I would have played this at 10, but at eight, I was running R RPGs. Well, yeah, I, I think your average 10 year old who yeah. isn't in a gamer, a uh, hobby gamer household wouldn't have yeah. a clue what to do with this. No, I don't think <laughs> so. I agree. So, yeah, I definitely got the suggestion that this was gateway to gateway to dungeon crawling. 
Um, theme was cool. Art, it, it works. It just it's not what you expect from yeah. the heavier. It, it, game. Allow, it, it leads to some 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 strangeness and disconnect almost. There, Math Guy Dave saying exactly what I said when we were playing this. Maybe you can make another FAQ video. It's yep. true. Like like this is it has the Gloomhaven problem. It's uh, it's only a I think it was a twelve page rule book, but it's at like three point font. It feels like. So oh, I, I well, and it it, it jumped. It jumps. Point, yes, it starts. You're like, oh, this is a nice font. Oh, this is getting a little tight. Oh wow, I need a, I need a magnifying glass to read this. Yeah, it's the, the, there's some odd choices like like why, why font size changed in that rule book. I don't understand. But yeah, it was tiny. Like it was. I I am gonna guess it's probably a word for word pretty close to the 34 page manual in Gloomhaven because Gloomhaven's nice big text and lots of spread out and lots of examples. Yep. This was walls and walls of text. Um, and presented in a weird rule book that's not in the order you actually need to learn things because you're supposed to use the other book to tell you the order. Uh, they tried to do the Fantasy Flight 2 book thing, and I just don't think it worked out all that well. And honestly, everyone at the table, like Tori and Kat said, I wish this was just one book, because at least then there'd only be one place to look. We spent yeah. too much going, grabbing one book, going, nope, it's not in here. Give me the other book. Okay, nope, it's not in here. Yeah, I would have much rather flipped back and forth in a ring bound, like a, like a an actual ring bound book and just flip between pages rather yeah. than than shuffling between the books that we had to do so now the bad news for people is it's going to be a while before we do a final review on this uh for one i gotta find a group to play it with really like because ha hammering out five games with my kids is now an epic un uh, undertaking and i honestly don't think my youngest is going to be able to play this one I, I, unless she just tells us what she wants to do and we do all the work um, that's another complaint. You have to play all four characters all the time, um, which is something that I just don't like, but I get it. I, uh, balancing your game for less players is hard. Yep. I, f I, I understand it. It's not rare in dungeon crawlers. Um, I'm more concerned about what's going to happen after scenario three. Uh, no spoilers. Cause I don't know for sure, but I have a pretty good idea what's going to happen after scenario three. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like Deanna's, <laughs> Deanna's hinting at the same thing. So yeah, Ghost Betwixt, um, if you're looking for a uniquely themed, you know, modern family investigating. Modern old, dungeon crawler, you know, horror, not, not horror, horror, but yeah, yeah I guess horror. -ish. horror it's horror. It's just yeah, it's, it's, horror. it's Saturday morning cartoon horror, not, yeah. not but, you, you know, know you're, you're using squirt guns with hot holy water in them. Cute, cute zombies and raccoons with uh, pumpkins on their heads. Yes, uh, yes. I, actually, the monsters are all actually pretty cool. Um, it's probably worth checking out, but just know what you're getting into and, and realize you're probably going to be on board game geek forums and, and looking up rules and rulings. And if you're not the kind of group to do that, if you have a group of rule lawyers, uh, Walk good away. luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> good luck to you. Cause you're going to argue about the first time. Do I get backstab damage from this or is the line of sight blocked over here? And, um, how can, can we each take this or do we each get two minutes to go shopping or is that for the whole group? Just little things that aren't quite clear. Yep. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, Ghost Betwixt needs to get played a few more times. I'm uh, still looking forward to more Scythe. Um, I was really surprised by how well the extended family took to Scythe. So that's going to happen. Um, at this point, I, I remember I told everyone we were going to do the one ring. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, there's just other stuff to get done, especially with Ghost Betwixt now in here. I think we're going to have to play with Tori and Kat. And here's the other thing I'll say about Ghost Betwixt. It seems like it's worth learning. I have a feeling we're going to get to a really good game. It's just that learning curve is steeper than I would have liked. I, ha I have a feeling it's going to shine once we get going. Yep. So Ghost Betwixt, um, no unboxing video scheduled. We're caught up for now on stuff. We still have a few to release. Um, nah, th th some new stuff might show up. I, the new thing that's annoying the heck out of me is, is companies are like, fill out this form to request a review copy, and then I hear nothing. And I still don't know if like magically I'm, I'm going to have a Gale moment where stuff's just going to show up on my porch or if they all decide not to work with us. And it's like people we worked with in the past, but they, they've changed stack. So, uh, yeah, these like I should have give you Racco to unbox. <laughs> I, I, I want to do it because I want to be surprised by how. The, oh, my God, it goes up to 60. I think I can play that one up and make it an amusing video. There we go. Uh, Sean, I don't think it's coming down. Uh, we need to work on extra life, though. I just don't know when that's going to fit in. We need to figure out what's going on locally for Extra Life. And of course, when we do that, we'll be sharing it here because we will be raising money for sick kids, which is a fantastic cause. Uh, it's our one yearly charity event. Yep. All right. 
Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Valentine Pache, thank you. Mechanical Muse, thank you. Matt Lichtenwaller, thanks, Matt. Roger Malosh, thanks, Roger. Zopi, thank you, but check your email. There was a problem with Scooby. There's a problem. We can't get the Scooby treats to you. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, you can show your support at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content, including at least an hour usually of bonus audio, if not more. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and I invite you to stick around and join us in the Penthouse Suite after show. And remember to come back next week for our four-year anniversary. That is on Wednesday, the 27th of July. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.